My main goal of this video is to show that people like Hawes and those who are associated with the Infrared Project or spout ideas such as patriotic socialism, conservative communism, and similar labels are bad Marxist according to the words of Marx, Engels, and Lenin themselves. I don't want this to turn into a historical debate, hence why I will leave my quotations to the three thinkers of whom we can both agree are orthodox Marxist. I am also not trying to delve into the details about Maoism, Stalinism, or other figures or countries that were led by self-described communist parties. Rather, I will be taking a look at the positions that Haas has taken and seeing how well they mesh with actual Marxist theory. For this reason, I will be quoting extensively from Marx, Engels, and Lenin to show that I am not just making stuff up, but rather showing how this socialist patriotism is no way true to Marxism, which leaves Haas as a bad Marxist and subsequently a bad nationalist. Because of this imminent dialectical critique I will be doing of Haas and holding him to the fire of his own purported ideology, my friends on the actual Marxist left should be in virtually unanimous agreement about everything I'm about to say. However, I do want to make it clear that I am not a Marxist. I am merely showing why Haas is a bad Marxist. For a more in-depth explanation about why communism is incompatible with conservatism, traditionalism, nationalism, etc., I suggest checking out the essay that my friends Altanus and I co-wrote together. Like in this video, we primarily relied off quotations from Marx, Engels, and Lenin. And again, with few exceptions, that is an essay that actual orthodox Marxist-Leninist should be able to easily agree with. In order to not have to watch hours and hours of live streams, I will be limiting my analysis of Haas to his formal explanation videos that he has, and that are even on the front page of his website. I'll also be using a few quotes from his substack as well. In his video, Socialist Patriotism, America vs. America, Haas and the Infrared Collective tried to lay out their case for socialist patriotism. Here, of course, socialism is meant as a scientific and Marxist socialism. The video sets out to answer, What was the actual relationship between socialists and patriotism historically? We are then immediately told, What becomes immediately clear is that the track record of the 19th and especially 20th centuries show that socialists and communists have consistently been patriotic and deeply attuned to the national realities of the countries they held from. Next, it's said that only due to Americanism do leftists say that imagine they can elevate themselves above national realities and speak on behalf of an abstract working class, uprooted and estranged from its particular and national instantiation. The first evidence provided of this long socialist patriotic tradition, allegedly going all the way back to Marx and Engels, is from the Communist Manifesto. Literally in the quote itself, Marx and Engels are quoted as, They speak of national struggle in form and not in substance. And the actual full quote then says, The proletariat of each country must, of course, first of all settle matters with its own bourgeoisie. The national struggle in particular countries is not the end-all, be-all. In fact, the Communist Manifesto is full of quotes promoting internationalism and anti-nationalism. The nationalities of the peoples who join together according to the principle of community will be just as much compelled by this union to merge with one another and thereby supersede themselves as the various differences between the states and classes disappear through the superseding of their basis, private property. We can also glean the Marxist view of nationalities from their views of religion as well. All religions, so far, have been the expression of historical stages of development of individual peoples or groups of peoples, but communism is the stage of historical development which makes all existing religions superfluous and brings about their disappearance. And as this video progresses, I will show more and more quotes and statements proving what should be an uncontroversial thesis that communism is in fact antithetical to nationalism. We are then presented with a quote from Marxist Critique of the Gotha Program. Which again is another cherry-picked quote. As the title suggests, Marxist critique of the Gotha program is a criticism of the planks put forth by Social Democratic Workers' Party of Germany, the so-called Gotha program. The specific quote the Infrared Collective chose stems from Marxist critique of point five of the Gotha program, which reads as follows. The working class strives for its emancipation, first of all, within the framework of the present-day national state, conscious that the necessary result of its efforts which are common to the workers of all civilized countries, will be the international brotherhood of peoples. And now, to give full context to the quote that was cherry-picked, Marx immediately after writes, The non-Marxist socialist LaSalle, in opposition to the Communist Manifesto and to all earlier socialism, conceived the workers' movement from the narrowest national standpoint. 
he is being followed in this, and that after the work of the international. It is altogether self-evident that, to be able to fight at all, the working class must organize itself at home as a class and that its own country is the immediate arena of its struggle. Insofar, its class struggle is national, not in substance, but, as the Communist Manifesto says, in form. So not only does the full context of this quote reveal how infrared is trying to distort the meaning of the quote, but the full quote also explicitly affirms my assertion that their previous cherry-picked quote from the Communist Manifesto is also being distorted for something it is not. Barely into the video, and they are already off to a poor start. The video then says, Marxist Leninists never advocate on behalf of an abstract, supranational working class, nor do they preach the destruction of their own nations and berate their own people for their ostensible backwardness. While the alleged Marxist Leninists they have in mind may have never said this, it is clear that both Marx, Engels, and Lenin all believed in this. Returning to the manifesto, Marx and Engels say, The communists are further reproached with desiring to abolish countries and nationality. The working men have no country. We cannot take from them what they have not got. National differences and antagonism between peoples are daily more and more vanishing, owing to the development of the bourgeoisie, to freedom of commerce, to the world market, to uniformity in the mode of production, and in the conditions of life corresponding thereto. The supremacy of the proletariat will cause them to vanish still faster. Now for Lenin, I will just provide one quote, although there are countless other statements by him expressing the exact same sentiment, some of which I will show later. The class-conscious workers fight hard against every kind of nationalism, both the crude, violent, black hunter nationalism, and that most refined nationalism which preaches the equality of nations together with the splitting up of the workers' cause, the workers' organizations, and the working class movement according to nationality. Unlike all the varieties of the nationalist bourgeoisie, the class-conscious workers stand not only for the most complete, consistent, and fully applied equality of nations and languages, but also for the amalgamation of the workers of the different nationalities in united proletarian organizations of every kind. Despite what these poorly read so-called Marxists assert, the core of Marxism is indeed about a supranational working class that has no nation. But they continue. The indisputable fact that communism invariably assumed a deeply national and patriotic form is not in fact due to the happenstance, but is directly tied up with the essence of socialism itself. Again, I'm going to quote from the quote they provided at the very beginning of their video from the manifesto. Though not in substance, yet in form, the struggle of the proletariat with the bourgeoisie is at first a national struggle. So, the Marxist variety of socialism is not, as they claim, deeply national. Neither is it part and parcel to the meaning of socialism itself. Marx and Engels are very explicit to write that the struggle is at first national, not in substance, but only in form, which is a key distinction in the Aristotelian-influenced Marx. In short, it means the core of Marxism is not national whatsoever, but for practical reasons, that is how it will probably occur at first due to proximity, linguistic barriers, and how bourgeois political power is currently divided. They then double down on this distorted view of Marxism. As first stated by Marx, and later elaborated upon by Stalin and Mao, the universal truth of Marxism finds expression only in specific national characteristics and its acquisition of a definite national form. This is perhaps the poorest reading of Marx I've ever heard. I'm not going into the issue of how true to Marx, Mao, and Stalin were, but even a cursory glance at the works of Marx, Engels, and Lenin shows that they always had a posited international and global revolution. While the revolution might start off, as we have already seen and explained, national in form, the substance will not be national, but it will merely be the stepping stone to an international revolution that is as global as capital itself is. It's honestly embarrassing that I'm having to explain basic tenets of Marxism to so-called Marxist-Leninists. The objectivity of the nation, including its rights, rituals, and the national spirit defining a people, is something which communists should strive to authentically express rather than ignore. The realities of the nation cannot be wished away, nor cheaply be considered a spook. Most of what we just heard was pure word salad nonsense and should make actual Marxist-Leninists cringe. This is a frankly static and non-dialectical view to see things like rights, rituals, and national spirit to be part of the objectivity of the nation, for as Engels explains, political, judicial, philosophical, religious, literary, artistic, etc. development is based on economic development, 
but all these react upon one another and also upon the economic base. It is not that the economic position is the cause and alone active, while everything else only has a passive effect. There is rather an interaction on the basis of the economic necessity which ultimately always asserts itself. He then explains in another of his letters, The economic situation is the base, but the different parts of the structure, the political forms of the class struggle and its results, the constitutions established by the victorious class after the battles won, forms of law, and even the reflection of all these real struggles in the brains of the participants, political theories, juridical, philosophical, religious opinions, and their further development into dogmatic systems, all this exercises also its influence on the development of the historical struggles and in cases determines their form. Marxists are thus not tasked to authentically express these things because all of these so-called cultural traits of a people that were listed are, as Engel has explained, based in part off economic development. Rather than deeply rooted, the culture is some sort of epiphenomena of other material factors. In Marxism, which seeks to revolutionize the means of production and the economic base, will thereby change these things as well. So how can all these cultural expressions of a people be authentic when the very goal of Marxism is to change them? The only conclusion, it seems, is that Infrared is not a Marxist organization. But don't just take my word for it. Here it is from Marx and Engels themselves. The nationality of the peoples associating themselves in accordance with the principle of community will be compelled to mingle with each other as a result of this association, and thereby to dissolve themselves, just as the various estates and class distinctions must disappear through the abolition of their basis, private property. Likewise, their notion that the realities of the nation cannot be wished away is equally laughable. One of the major threads that permeates Marx's body of work is that Marx sees the revolutionary forces of the bourgeoisie and capitalism, and he is very elucidating on just how much they are destroying the nation and everything else they touch. To quote that famous line from the manifesto, Constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguish the bourgeois epoch from all earlier ones. All fixed, fast-frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new-formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into air. All that is holy is profaned, and man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. The whole point of Marxism is to realize that these realities can be wished away and are currently being destroyed. This is what Marx saw in his time in the 1800s and has only increased during our time as capitalism has spread and intensified. But Marx, as a non-reactionary socialist, sees this as a good thing, and says explicitly that this process will be accelerated under his form of socialism. But let's continue on. Like the liberal cosmopolitans, reactionaries confuse the outward appearance of the nation with its essence, which is inexhaustible and irreducible to its existent form. Again, this is just more word salad. Less than two minutes ago in the video they said, The objectivity of the nation including its rights, rituals, and the national spirit defining a people, is something which communists should strive to authentically express rather than ignore. The realities of the nation cannot be wished away, nor cheaply be considered a spook. Literally confusing the outward appearance of the nation with its essence, it is they who are engaging in a phenomenal reduction. This same idealism permeates the idolaters' corrupted vision of internationalism, a word long since abused by the post-60s left. Internationalism, for the fake and anti-popular left, exists at the expense of national realities. The revolution, it is imagined, abolishes borders, peoples, and nations all at once, on the basis of their offense to universal reason, justice, or other golden idols. Again, Infrared is showing how little they understand Marx. Marx, as a good Hegelian and radical bourgeois thinker, very much believes, as I have already shown, in a global and borderless world, as well as he believes in that so-called golden idol of universal reason, which after a quick search I was able to find at least two positive uses of that term in the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right and in a newspaper article he wrote on May 10th, 1842. And that is why, for Marxists historically, internationalism comes into being through the nation, and corresponded to a deepening of national realities, rather than their forsaking. All this shows, in light of all the evidence I have brought, is just how not Marxist those countries were. 
the birth of the United States has seen the development of various local and quasi-national traditions with deep roots, from Appalachian Americans to the Black Belt. They have long since become indigenized, and it is in fact their uprooting at the hands of the American oligarchy that constitutes a proletarianization of white America. It seems like here they are making, as Marx would call it, a reactionary socialist point, and they are being rather undialectical in their inability to see the irony in capitalism's proletarianization, which sows the seeds of its own destruction. As Engels wrote in Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, it is the compelling force of anarchy in the production of society at large that more and more completely churns the great majority of men into proletarians, and it is the masses of the proletariat again who will finally put an end to anarchy in production. They then start attacking leftists in the Land Back Movement, which, according to Wikipedia, is a campaign that seeks to establish political and economic control to indigenous people in the United States and Canada over land that had historically belonged to them prior to colonization following the Age of Exploration. Laughably, after a lot of twisted logic, they come to this conclusion. Which is why J. Sakai leftists never have and never will pose a threat to the existing establishment and are in practice the radical left flank of actually existing white supremacy. Aside from asserting that a movement to give Native Americans sovereign control over land is white supremacist, let's see what they have to say actually about land reform. This is why communism has nothing to do with land back and everything to do with land reform. It is only in the reparcelation of land as the most basic means of production that the productive capacities and entrepreneurial spirit of the American people can be unleashed. Ignoring the fact that agricultural employment is only around 1% of the workforce in America, infrared again, as I've shown time and time again now, fails to understand Marx. Let's look at what Marx, Engels, and Lenin had to say about this so-called land reform in its reparcelization. In The Peasant Question in France and Germany, Engels writes, in the context of critiquing another socialist party's platform, Socialism's task is, rather, only to transfer the means of production to the producers as their common possession. As soon as we lose sight of this, the above statement becomes directly misleading in that it implies that it is the mission of socialism to convert the present sham property of the small peasant in his fields into real property, that is to say, to convert the small tenant into an owner and the indebted owner into a debtless owner. Undoubtedly, socialism is interested to see that the false semblance of peasant property should disappear, but not in this manner. In a similar vein, Marx wrote, the petty bourgeoisie will want to give the feudal lands to the peasants as free property. They will try to perpetrate the existence of the rural proletariat and to form a petty bourgeoisie peasant class which will be subject to the same cycle of impoverishment and debt which still afflicts the French peasant. The workers must oppose this plan both in the interest of the rural proletariat and in their own interest. They must demand that the confiscated feudal property remain state property and be used for workers' colonies, cultivated collectively by the rural proletariat with all the advantages of large-scale farming, and where the principle of common property will immediately achieve a sound basis in the midst of the shaky system of bourgeois property relations. And lastly, to top it off, I'll quote from Lenin, who was attacking the Narodniks in Russia for wanting to parcel out the land. The catchword of socialization of the land merely denotes the left Narodniks' utter failure to grasp the principle of Marxist political economy and the fact that they are going over, stealthily, by fits and starts and often unconsciously, to the side of bourgeois political economy. Marx advised class-conscious workers, while forming a clear idea of the bourgeois character of all agrarian reforms under capitalism, including the nationalization of the land, to support bourgeois democratic reforms as against the feudalist and serfdom, but Marxists cannot confuse bourgeois measures with socialism. But this idea of land reform is something that has harped on a lot in their videos, such in another of their explanation videos called The Meaning of Socialism in 2021, where they continue advocating for land reform. Politicians and parties can make all the promises they want. At the, at the end of the day, land or economic space, the most important means of production, is the only thing that makes promises a reality. For the black majority to be able to rule and live dignified lives in their own country, land is the simplest and most fundamental premise. It's the foundation of civilization itself. It's what allows people not to have to depend on politicians' promises, but be able to, in the first place, cultivate a sense of living being independent. 
aside from the anti-Marxist characteristic of land reform, the idea that land is the most important means of production is yet another anti-Marxist position. This idea is not a new idea, and in fact it predates Marx. This belief of the so-called physiocrats, some of the first bourgeois economists coming from France and are actually the people who coined the term laissez-faire. Marx studied these physiocrats and was even in some way influenced by them, in the same way he was influenced by other bourgeois economists such as Adam Smith and David Ricardo. However, Marx rejected their core economic claim of land being the most important means of production as early as the 1844 manuscripts to as late as Volume 3 of Capital. For the physiocrats, this analysis coincides with the analysis of rent, the only form of surplus value which they recognize. Therefore, they consider rent yielding or agricultural capital to be the only capital producing surplus value, and the agricultural labor set in motion by it the only labor producing surplus value. Marx then succinctly critiques this view in his economic manuscripts by saying, Hence the contradictions in the system of the physiocrats. It was the first to explain surplus value by the appropriation of the labor of others, and in fact to explain this appropriation on the basis of the exchange of commodities. But it did not see that value in the general form of social labor and that surplus value is surplus labor. On the contrary, it conceived value merely as use value, merely as material substance, and surplus value as a mere gift of nature, which returns to labor, in place of a given quantity of organic material, a greater quantity. On the one hand, it stripped rent, that is, the true economic form of landed property, of its feudal wrapping and reduced it to mere surplus value in excess of the laborer's wage. On the other hand, this surplus value is explained again in a feudal way, as derived from nature and not from society, from man's relation to the soil, not from his social relations. So, instead of having a dialectical view of man and his social relations in the proper Marxian sense, Haas and Infrared are repeating the same errors that Marx pointed out of the physiocrats. For them, the land is seen as a source of wealth in and of itself that simply needs to be redistributed and all will go well, sounding more like utopian socialist than true dialectical Marxists. To further drive this point home, I will show how Marx even goes as far as to consider the idea that land is the most important means of production to be an error in a feudal point of view. From the manuscripts of 1844, it is argued against physiocracy that agriculture does not differ from any other industry and that the essence of wealth, therefore, is not a specific form of labor bound to a particular element, a particular expression of labor, but labor in general. Physiocracy denies particular, external, merely objective wealth by declaring labor to be the essence of wealth. But for physiocracy, labor is at first only the subjective essence of landed property. It annuls its feudal character by declaring industry, agriculture, as its essence. But it disavows the world of industry and acknowledges the feudal system by declaring agriculture to be the only industry. Land reform is neo-physiocratism, not revolutionary Marxism. Now, later in their video, they actually bring up for once a very Marxist point in that, if you buy the Marxist framework, that there is revolutionary potential in America. To do this, they bring up a quote from Lenin's Letter to the American Working People. I don't want to talk about this argument, but I would like to further hammer home the cosmopolitan and universalistic nature of Marxism. For in that same letter where they quote Lenin, Lenin himself further undermines this idea of socialist patriotism that they've been spouting this entire time. Specifically, where his letter says, But must socialists wait with their cause, the cause of liberating the working people of the whole world from the yoke of capital, of winning universal and lasting peace until a path without sacrifice is found? Must they fear to open the battle until an easy victory is guaranteed? Must they place the integrity and security of their bourgeois-created fatherland above the interest of the world's socialist revolution? The scoundrels in the international socialist movement who think this way, those lackeys who grovel to bourgeois morality, thrice stand condemned. So according to Lenin in the letter that they cite, their patriotism is mere bourgeois morality, and Haas and socialistic patriots can either listen to Lenin and be actually principled Marxist-Leninist, which, while still wrong, would at least be principled, or they can go on about how American socialist patriotism, meanwhile, correctly charts the Stalinist golden middle. Another anti-Marxist line of reasoning that permeates this so-called communist conservatism is this romantic view of the peasantry, a view that they even mistakenly foist upon both Marx and Lenin. 
As a matter of fact, many westernized Marxists were especially complicit in the stigmatization and oppression of the peasants, because they didn't conform to the model of the traditional industrial worker. To this very day, dogmatic Marxists have yet to appreciate the significance of the peasantry. And as Hawes wrote in one of his Substack articles, In his 1899 work, The Development of Capitalism in Russia, Lenin viewed the democratic veneer of the urban bourgeoisie as just that, a veneer which disguised the impotence of their class in the face of czarism. To exhume the future, he looked to the most backward and underdeveloped segment of the Russian Empire, the peasantry, in order to predict how capitalism would come to develop. In other words, he more or less completely ignored the urban bourgeoisie and urban petty bourgeoisie as worthless parasites with absolutely no historical future, and immediately decided to go down to the countryside. To derive the long-term political strategy of the Russian Social Democratic Party in relation to the overthrow of Tsarism. For Lenin, the essence of the democratic revolution lied not in the enlightened, educated urban bourgeoisie toppling the Tsar, a laughably unlikely scenario, but in the peasant striving for land reform. Again, the historical revisionism runs deep. Communism is to be achieved through the dictatorship of the proletariat, not the dictatorship of petty bourgeois peasants. While others will be involved in the revolution, fundamentally, the revolutionary agents are the proletarians. This is literally Marxism 101, which anyone who has done any cursory reading of, say, the Communist Manifesto should be able to understand. The lower middle class, the small manufacturer, the shopkeeper, the artisan, the peasant, all these fight against the bourgeoisie to save from extinction their existence as fractions of the middle class. They are therefore not revolutionary, but conservative. I find it particularly funny to point out to these self-described conservatives that Marx is using that word conservative as a pejorative here. And I know I've already demonstrably shown that land reform is an anti-Marxist proposal, but perhaps another quote can't hurt. So I cite Lenin in saying, There will be only land which is national property and free tenants renting land from the state. When you set up this system, it will not mean the transfer of land to all of the working people. It will merely mean that every farmer will freely dispose of his land. Anybody who wants land will be free to rent it from the state. Now that land reform has been 100% shown to be a Marxist heresy, I now turn my attention to Lenin and the peasantry. The bulk of Haas's project seems to stem from the sort of romanticization of the peasantry. He even goes into this sort of Walmart brand Heideggerianism in talking about the living being of the peasantry. The deep and earthly reality of Chinese peasants. This is a reality that can never be reduced to any superficial culture, but as an entrenched unconscious basis. I've already harped on Marx's view of the peasantry, but now let's turn to Lenin. Maybe Lenin, with his focus on the less industrialized and more agrarian Russia, saw the revolution as originating with the peasants? Again, no. While there is a role that peasants can play, even Lenin makes it very clear that first and foremost, the revolutionary agents are the proletarians. The fight for socialism is a fight against the rule of capital. It is being carried on first and foremost by the wage workers, who are directly and wholly dependent on capital. As for the small farmers, some of them own capital themselves, and often themselves exploit workers. Hence, not all small peasants join the ranks of fighters for socialism. Only those who do so resolutely and consciously side with the workers against capital, with public property against private property. How such a basic tenet of Marxism is lost, I do not know. But this attempt to downplay the role of the proletariat for some romanticized peasantry seems to be rather endemic in their thought. For instance, in talking about South Africa, they lament the fact that the post-apartheid ANC didn't do land reform which, instead of making the black population into a nation of petty bourgeoisie, instead caused mass proletarianization. The ANC has continued to assume the appearance of a nominally socialist party in South Africa as a nominally social state with its reconstruction and development program initiated in the 1990s. But an unprecedented type of proletarianization has occurred in South Africa since then, ironically as a result of the end of political apartheid. Rather than taking up a basic dialectical view in seeing how the bourgeoisie are digging their own graves through the creation of proletarians, as Marx and Engels wrote about throughout their whole lives, they instead take what Marx and Engels would call a reactionary view of trying to oppose proletarianization. In order to try to cope with this, they simply try to imply that Marxism is really about the revolution coming from the peasantry and try to act like they don't even know what the word proletarian means. 
and the fact that the majority of people in any given nation never conform to some model of the true proletariat. And a similar idea is expressed on Haas's substack when he writes, The proletarian subject is not neatly defined within the ranks of the people. Despite the fact that Marx and Engels in all their works very clearly and very concisely lay out what the definition of proletarian means, all this is indicative that they don't understand Marxism, and frankly it's embarrassing that I, an anti-Marxist and someone who has never even been a Marxist, understands the revolutionary project of Marx, Engels, and Lenin, and all the rest I am leaving out, better than Haas himself does. It should be clear by now that the entire infrared project in this so-called patriotic socialism or conservative communism is completely unfounded from their own alleged positions. Plain and simply, they are bad Marxist. And the truth is, is that the so-called Western left or Baitswa, however cringe and aesthetically deficient they may be, are better Marxist than the so-called patriotic communist left when it comes to actually following and adhering to dialectical and revolutionary socialism as detailed by Marx, Engels, and Lenin. As Zoltanis and I have already shown, there is no possible way in which conservatism or any form of nationalism can mesh with communism. The two are at fundamental odds in every way possible. Even their two critiques of capitalism are incompatible with each other. At the end of the day, what we have with the Infrared Project and all the other patriotic socialists is people who are both bad Marxist and bad conservatives. With this, there is nothing left for their ideology to stand on besides perhaps some crude aesthetic theory and all they can do is scream about Trotskyites, Baitswa, and Anglo-metaphysics.